Therefore, when John addeth, If our hearts condemn us not, then we have confidence with God. His meaning is not as if we could have no confidence where our hearts do condemn us in some degrees, for then none in the world would have confidence. But he speaks of condemning ourselves upon a discovery of a total and willful hypocrisy, and so we will indeed grant that he speaks of hypocrites. But yet it proveth as much as we desire, namely, that where there is any condemnation of ourselves for any degree of, insin of insincerity in any duty, we are to tremble and to remember that God is greater than our hearts, knoweth more by us, and so his wrath might break out hotter than we can imagine. Neither is the former answer weakened, though we grant it to be understood of total hypocrites. For it is usual with the apostle to threaten even those that are godly and dear to him with the condition and punishment of hypocrites and apostates, as Hebrews 6, see another instance, 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, I know nothing by myself, yet am I not thereby justified, for it is God that judgeth me. Where the apostle doth not speak of an anabaptistical perfection, as if Paul knew no sin by himself, but his meaning is to be restrained to the faithful dispensation of the office committed to him, in which, though he had not perfection, yet his conscience did not accuse him of gross negligence nor unfaithfulness. But for all this, he doth not think himself justified by any godliness in himself. And why so? Because God judgeth him who takes notice of, and is offended with more sins than he understands by himself, so that Paul doth acknowledge God to see sin in him, and therefore he cannot be justified by anything inherent. And this made Bernard say excellency to say excellently, excuse me, to tor est justitai donata quam inherens. Imputed righteousness is safer to rely upon than inherent. Think it therefore a small thing to be acquitted by antinomian principles, when it is God that judgeth. And whatsoever the adversary speaketh about a righteousness of Christ communicated unto us, so that thereby God seeth no sin. Yet because they say he seeth no sin in us inherently, they must conclude for some perfect inherent righteousness. Lastly, Psalm 19, David crying out, Who can understand his errors? Prayeth thereupon, Cleanse thou me from secret sins. And this doth imply that there were many sins that David had, which were loathsome and foul in God's eyes, though undiscovered by himself, and therefore he would have God wash him and make him clean. A seventh rank of arguments shall be from those places wherein God hath commanded ministers to bind and retain the sins of scandalous offenders, and hath promised to ratify that in heaven, which they, according to his will, do on earth. Experience witnesseth that a justified person may fall into some scandalous sin, whereby the whole congregation may be much offended, and God highly provoked. Now in this case, God hath commanded the ministers of the gospel to bind and to restrain such a man's sins, till he doth repent. This binding is not by way of authority, but ministerial declaration, and effectual application of God's threatenings in his word to such a person's sinning. And when this is done, God hath promised that all this shall be ratified and made good in heaven against that man. Now, how can God make good the minister's threatenings applied to that godly man, if he take not notice and be not offended with the person so heinously sinning? The places that prove such a binding of sin and God's ratifying of their sentence are John 20, verse 23, Matthew 16, verse 19, Matthew 18, verse 18. Can any man say... That when a godly man is cast out of God's family, the seals of God's grace denied him, and he delivered up to Satan. That God is not angry with him? Yea, is not he bound then to apprehend God, estranged from him? When a godly man is excommunicated, he is not only cast out from the external church society, but likewise there is a deprivation from internal communion with Christ not as if he were cut off from the purpose or decree of God's election, or as if the habitual seed of grace were quite extinct in him, but only as the outward seals of God's favor are denied him, so also doth God, being angry with him, deny him any inward testimonies of his favor, and it would not be faith against sense, as the adversary calls it, but presumption against scripture to say, God was at that time well pleased with him. 
Yea, divines say that there is a conditional exclusion of the person so offending from future glory. For the church threatens him, that, as they judge him now, and bid him depart from their society, so if he do not repent, Christ at the last day will command him to depart from his presence and the holy angels, according to that of Tertullian in Apologetico. Summum futuri judici prejudicium est sae quis it a delinquerit ut a communicatione orationis and covenantis and ominous sancti camericae religator. The eighth kind of arguments from those places where Christ is said to be still an advocate and to make intercessions for believers after they are justified, which would be altogether needless if God did not take notice of their sins and were ready to charge them upon believe, were ready to charge them upon believers. Excuse me. Consider the places: First John two verse one and Hebrews seven verse twenty five. In the former place, John, having said that Christ's blood cleansed us from all sin. A place the antinomian much urgeth, not considering that at the same time the apostle in verse 9 requireth confessions and shame in ourselves, if we would have pardon. In the first verse of the second chapter, he saith, he writes these things that they should not sin. All true doctrine about Christ and free grace tendeth to the demolishing and not encouraging of sin. But the apostle supposeth such fragility that we will sin and therefore speaketh of a remedy. If we sin, we have an advocate. Now this makes several waves against the antinomian. First, that sins committed after our justification need an advocate. It is not enough that we were once justified. Our new sins would condemn us for all that, were it not for Christ. Secondly, in that Christ is an advocate, it supposeth that though God be a father to his people, yet he is also a judge. That, and that he so taketh notice of and is displeased with their sins. That did not Christ intercede and deprecate the wrath of God, it would utterly consume them. Thou therefore, who sayest God the Father is not offended, why then doth Christ perform the office of an advocate? If thy sins be not brought into the court, what need any pleading for thee? In the other place, Hebrews 7 verse 25, the apostle acknowledgeth a twofold function of Christ's priestly office. The one is the offering up of himself for our sins. The second is the continual intercession for us, which the apostle, in chapter 9, verse 24, calleth appearing before God's face in our behalf. Now, we must not so advance Christ's sufferings in the taking away of sin so as to exclude the other part of his priestly office, which is continually to plead our cause for us. For the apostle makes Christ to stand before the face of God, as some great favorite before an earthly prince, to plead in the behalf of those who are accused. So that the doctrine which denieth God seeing of sin in his people doth wholly overthrow Christ's intercession and the efficacy of it. Concerning the manner of Christ's intercession, it is not to be conceived in that way as he prayed here upon the earth, but it is his holy will and express desire of his soul that God the Father should be reconciled with those for whom he hath shed his blood, and truly that point of divinity, that is, Christ's affections, and sympathizing with his people now in heaven, is an ocean of infinite comfort.